Hello, welcome to Trash Arts Tick, Season 3, Episode 7, with myself, Ryan. We got Sam and we got Jackson. Hey. This week, guys, um, Sam's going to bring us up to speed with everything industry. And then Sam actually had the pleasure of interviewing Bobby LaPierre. Sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Bobby. Um, he's actually the editor of Film Threat. And Film Threat is a film website which does reviews and stuff like that. So, yeah, Sam will take us through that. And then we actually wanted to discuss video game films this week. And actually whether or not the transition from a video game into a film is any good. Um, and if so, what makes it good? And if it isn't, why? And what's the reasons? So without further ado, over to you Sam, industry. So on Sunday was the Golden Globes or the Golden Globes disaster. <laughs> it was all on Zoom. Now, of course, as anyone knows over the last year, Zoom can have its problems. But other award ceremonies, like the Emmys, they did it on Zoom and everyone loved it and it went perfectly. It did not go the same with the Golden Globes. Now, the Golden Globes already had a lot of controversy, simply because it's been revealed that they have not had any black members in their whole entire time. It's ridiculous, isn't it? That's... Yeah, it's a real misrepresentation. And they try to, like, you know, apologise for it, they're going to change that kind of thing. But in effect, it just shows that it's a very pointless award ceremony. But it gives the hint towards the Oscars, so people still pay attention to it. And it looks like Nomadland is still the front runner. It won Best Director for Chloe Zhao, and it won Best Film. So that's probably still the Oscar front runner. Doesn't seem like it's going to change in any sort of way. But at least that's getting closer because the Oscars are announced on March 16th. And if you've looked at the films that won every other award, you can kind of predict where the Oscars going to go. But that's the fun of it, right? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> well I love it the obvious predictions and then the surprises like last year Parasite winning that was an amazing moment yeah. don't think that's going to happen this time but there'll be some worthy winners so there's two films that are uh, based on artists within the music industry that have been announced one is ludicrous and the, um, the other one's personally kind of annoying doesn't matter about your opinion on the film Sam <laughs> it's, I'll explain why there's a personal annoyance for it well, I meant ludicrous. Well, I'll explain to you the ludicrous one first, then. <laughs> yeah. So there's a film biopic about Robbie Williams currently being sold at the EFM. Now, Robbie Williams is in Take That, Robbie Williams. But this is to be directed by the director of The Greatest Showman on Earth. And Robbie Williams, this is where it's ludicrous, is to be played by a CGI monkey. What? And they want a budget of $100 million to do it. What? Yeah. Ludicrous, right? But they're selling at the market and they've all agreed to it. Makes you curious about it. But when you said ludicrous, I thought you meant like the rapper. No, no, no. You no, actually, no. oh, that's why I did the joke. <laughs> no. Now, the other film is a film about Jeff Buckley to be played by Reeve uh, Carney. I have no idea who that is. And directed by Orion Williams. And this is his first film. The reason why this annoys me is that I've always wanted to make a film about Jeff Buckley and Tim Buckley as a sort of side thing, because they both died at a young age and they were both musicians and they were father and son. This film ain't going to be that developed. So <laughs> I'm just like, well, another crappy Jeff, Jeff Buckley film coming. And maybe one day I can do mine. <laughs> <laughs> Returning to independent cinema, uh, Kamal Yildirim, who recently appeared on our discussion about New York cinema in the 1970s and 80s, is doing a Kickstarter. They're raising 25000 for The Haunting of Lady Jane. They're doing pretty good. It's going quite well. There should be a link on the screen if you can help support them. It's a very ambitious kind of monsters and old haunted houses. If you can check out a link and support him, that'd be awesome. Thank you, Sam. Um, so back to Sam. Sam had the pleasure of interviewing Bobby Lapierre. So like I said before, he's the editor of Film Threat and um, they basically do the film website with different reviews and stuff. So over to you, Sam, for that interview. I'm on Trash House Take with Bobby LePierre. How are you doing, man? You good? I am good. Excited to be doing this. Oh, it's, good. it's good to have you on, man. Like We've been chatting, obviously, more over the last year with the stuff you've been doing film threats. So I'm very happy you've joined us. So what got you interested in films? Um, moving around a lot, really. Uh, uh, so I was born in uh, Glendale, California, which is a suburb of... Uh, Los Angeles, which is, of course, where Hollywood is. That's where 
where my mom grew up. So she was always in the movie scene doing various things on some productions, being a talent scout or whatever. Uh, so, you know, movies were just all, kind of always around. Then I was, hmm, like eight, I think, when we first moved from the United States to uh, Accra, uh, which is uh, uh, long, uh, in Ghana, along the Gold Coast of Africa. And um, in order to, like, keep, I guess, I don't know a better way of phrasing that, the um, part of the country we came from a lot. My parents recorded a bunch of movies off of TV, and we, like, bought a whole bunch of VHS tapes and, like, kind of took that stuff over with us so when we first moved what i had that i understood in english was movies then we moved again and once again what we had uh was movies in english um and by the time i like we moved again that was to uh, bond germany um, I was able to make friends over, you know, they knew this movie, mm. I knew that movie, and that's how we would bond. Um, it doesn't matter what continent you live on, Star Wars is big, no matter where you live. <laughs> that will always be a cultural, uh, cultural touchstone on every place on this planet. I'm fairly certain if you go to Antarctica, penguins have lightsaber duels. <laughs> J- just saying. Um, and yeah, uh, so there was... And it just kind of never went away. You know, we moved back to the United States permanently. And, uh, yeah, so they were just kind of always there. And it's what grabbed me. I like other art, but for some reason, partially because they were always there, that's that's uh, what speaks to me the most. So, like, at every point when someone starts to take an interest in film, there's always that choice. Are you behind the scenes, in front of the camera? But you decided to look more at journalism. So what made you interested in film journalism? I'm a nosy son of a bitch. Um, uh, in high school, I was in a journal a journalism class. I was in a creative writing class. I really enjoyed writing. And um, I was in drama, which is the closest thing we had to a film production kind of thing um, in high school. And uh, I just really like talking to people and getting information. And um, whenever I go to my day job, and uh, I, I kind of just have a set question. I ask everybody, and I call it an interrogation. It's not really, it's just like, how are you? How's your family? How's your dog if you have one? You know, that kind of thing. Mm. But I ask every day, because if I haven't seen him in a day or two, something can change. So I like knowing what's going on all the time, always. And then when I was working at a movie theater um, right after high school, uh, my friends and I would... Uh, good to go see movies for free and that was pretty cool and at the time I wasn't I, I had done a few tiny reviews for like uh, uh, the local newspaper and stuff but nothing serious at all um, and was still somewhat considering a like actual movie career of some sort be it writing or directing or editing however that would go up uh, it was a uh, dating somebody at the time who's actually a uh, sound designer and some editor for uh, TV shows for MTV. Okay. Um, uh, that, that is what she went on to go do. And by working at the movie theater, we would just be hanging out afterwards, either at the theater, somewhere to eat, somebody's house, whatever. And we would just sit around and talk about movies. And that's kind of what I had the most fun with. Like watching the movies enjoyable presumably if it's a good movie Mm. uh but talking about it with somebody afterwards is really what led me to be like yeah this is kind of fun and then there's a website called joblo.com i believe they're canadian i'm not positive on that um and they do did i it's been so long i don't know if it's still a thing anymore uh a column called unpopular opinion and um when the movie Bridesmaids came out, I wrote one f- for them because it was a user-submitted thing. So even if you weren't a regular critic, if you had an unpopular movie on X, uh, an unpopular opinion on X title, they would be like, hey, submit it to us and we'll run it if we thought it was good enough. It ran, got a decent response, 
mostly in the form of people disagreeing with me, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, and from there, a uh, few years later, I launched a very crude, very badly designed website uh, that I created on my own. Um, it looks terrible. It was hard to navigate. It was junk. But then I just started writing my own reviews. So this um, this was around the time that you started uh, terribly fun films. Now, um, yes. Uh, from what you've just been saying, like yeah. understanding completely where you're going with it, like film conversation is a great thing. And of course, when a film is absolutely awful, <laughs> there can be an interesting chat. Was that one of the reasons why you wanted to do terribly fun films? Um, terribly fun films came about because I wanted to highlight the low budget movies that weren't terrible Uh terrible um um can mean bad can Mm. also be like oh that was terribly exciting as in very as in extremely you know um so i thought it'd be a fun play on words in that regard uh so yeah so when that site launched terribly fun films it was really like uh hey this movie might have only been made for five dollars but you know the lighting is very strong. The editing is pretty good. Even if the acting is cheesy or the dialogue is stupid, um, there's still something to like there. Um, of course, I definitely took the piss out of movies that are just so bad they're good. Because <laughs> um, sometimes a movie that's just terrible all the way around is still something fun to watch. Um, so it really came out of my love of low-budget movies but knowing that even their, though they're low budget doesn't make them bad, but I, I, you can still be cheesy and stupid and you can still offer something, be it entertainment value, be it something where it's clear that the love, the passion that the filmmakers, the cast and the crew and everyone put into the project oozes through the movie, um, that sort of thing. So did this lead to you getting involved with uh, Film Threat? And were you a fan of the previous incarnation of Film Threat? I did not know what Film Threat was for the longest time. Um, um, uh, I think I was just a little too young for it. And I don't know how much of a dent it made overseas. Um, It might have been pretty big overseas where I was living. I genuinely don't know. Uh, In 2000 and five question mark not sure on the date uh the person who founded uh film threat while he was in college his name is chris gore he hosted a tv show called the new movie show and i believe it was on reels channel which is now a defunct movie based channel uh movie as in it's about films they showed some movies but Mm. they also had shows about movies um they had a game show about like who was the bigger movie nerd type thing and they had this review show called the new movie show and i loved the new movie show i thought it was great i enjoyed the format it had a rotating stable of guests so there was one host and then guests and the guests were always related to film somehow some of them were other critics some of them were directors or actors or producers or what have you um and the rating scale is what stuck with me on that show. It was a skip it entirely, and those were the worst movie reviewed that week. Uh, watch it on TV, rent it. Uh, this was Blockbuster and all those places were still around at the time. Mm. Um, uh, buy it when it comes out on home video, and then go to the movies to see it. Um, that is the rating scale, and I really liked that scale quite a bit. It wasn't a number, but you still got the idea of what they thought of the movie just by looking at the scale. Um, so I really loved that. And that's how I was familiar with Chris Gore. And then I'd see him here and there on various shows or movies he would make appearance, appearances in. Um, and then in like February or so of 2017, because uh, I follow uh, Chris Gore on, um, on Twitter, uh, he had sent a message to a whole bunch of people saying how he was relaunching Film Threat. And I just completely ignored it. <laughs> I, I was like, I don't know what Film Threat is. Moving on with my day. That same year, I'm going to a convention in Atlanta, Georgia, called Dragon Con. And uh, had a great time. Loved it. Dragon Con is amazing. Chris Gore is one of the people 
at Dragon Con. Apparently, he's been going every year for several, several years. And so I go to this panel called The State of Geek Cinema, and uh, he's hosting it, and it's about nerd movie stuff. You know, it's talking about the MCU, the DCEU, uh, various nerdy TV shows like The Walking Dead. And that's it. It's just talking about geekdom and pop culture, how it's sort of per, uh, per, peripheral. I can't talk right now. <laughs> uh, how it sort of uh, seeped into the social consciousness. After that, I had a book of his about um, about sequels that will never get made uh, that he wrote in like 2001. And uh, he signed it. We got to talking. About a month later, uh, backing up a little bit, while we were talking at Dragon Con, he had mentioned the relaunch and how they were looking for writers. So after that, about a month later, I sent in some of my already written reviews. Uh, by that point, I had started doing a YouTube show that was much worse than my website in terms of the quality uh, quality of it. So I sent two written reviews and one video review. And uh, he saw potential in it, I guess. So uh, he brought me on as a permanent writer. That's awesome, man. And then when you're reviewing an indie film compared to like a studio pick, now obviously there's like complete differences, but do you try to, I don't know, cancel out the more obvious glaring problems with a lower budget film than a higher budget film? Or do you just treat them? Uh, Yes, I would say yes to that. Um, Mainly the way I look at a movie is what is it trying to do and how successful is it? So if you're a drama and you want me to, you know, uh, break my heart at the end of your movie uh, because one of the two main characters dies, if I don't care that that main character died, it doesn't matter what your budget was, you failed at being a good drama. If you're a comedy and I'm laughing so hard I'm missing other jokes because the last joke was so funny, you're a very good comedy. That is not always down to budget. It can be is if it's a visual gag or mm. something like that, but it's not always. So the question is, what does the movie want to do, and does it succeed? From there, if the answer is it's a drama, does it succeed? Yes. From there, we break it down further into, okay, because it succeeds overall, are there elements to the movie that don't 100% work? If so, why not? If you're a big uh, if you're an action film and your editing's a bit wonky and confusing at times, but you only cost a hundred thousand dollars versus a hundred million dollars, I'm gonna let that slide. But if you're a um, if you're uh, I don't know, let's uh, go with the Suicide Squad movie, and you have confusing uh, confusing confusing action because, well, your director sucks, at least for that film, and you cost $100 million to make, I'm not going to let that slide. You had the resources, you had the budget, you could have made something coherent and you failed. Whereas if it's a passion project being filmed on a weekend by a guy living in India, um, I, I like mistakes are going to happen. I completely agree with you, man. I appreciate that you do that because uh, I always wonder. I always wonder whether a reviewer does. Now, obviously, reviewer in like the modern era. I still personally think reviewers are very important to films, and I know there's always a um, sort of like a backlash or a criticism to reviewers nowadays. And it probably doesn't help that you have so many. Well, so many people can be a critic nowadays because of social media. How do you feel about like the role of a reviewer now? Uh, I think it's still important. I think the problem is what people consider to be a uh, proper review versus just somebody's opinion. So mm. you and I go see a movie together. We uh, then leave the film. We run into a mutual friend of ours. That friend asks what we thought of the film. Hypothetically, um, I go, well, it's a movie about aliens invading from space. It was fun. That's not a review. That is a tiny plot synopsis with my opinion at the end. That's not a review. A review should be able to explain why something worked 
or did not work within the film and whether the things that worked or did not work outweigh each other. Therefore, that gives you your score of good or bad mm. um, or completely middle of the road. Um, and I think with the rise of things like user reviews on Rotten Tomatoes and just Rotten Tomatoes in general, which I don't care for, um, it has everybody thinking that. But if you go on to like Amazon and you read a review that just says this movie was a waste of time, um, that doesn't tell me anything. Why was it a waste of time? What what caused this person to be so mad at the movie? If they took the time to write this movie was a waste of time, um, I don't know. I can't answer that question. So that's not a review. Critics do reviews. Mm. Anybody can have an opinion. And I think everybody should have an opinion. And if you disagree with me on my opinion, that's great. We'll talk about it. But that doesn't mean your opinion is a full blown review. No, I agree with you. Like it's like it's like IMDb. IMDb, um, you can put any review you want on there. Now, of course, recently this has been taken over by people trolling and downscoring films, whether you don't even yeah, have you've watched. Before movies them. even come out, which it's very stressful for independent filmmakers because obviously uh, on the studio level, they have more marketing control over this. But for the smaller filmmakers, and when you're on Amazon and stuff like that, all you see is a 3.6 and someone goes, ah, what's the point? And it, it kind of damages to me personally the idea of what a reviewer is. That makes sense. Um, I wish I had a way of fixing that, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it just makes it harder for independent filmmakers to understand, like, it's important to get your film reviewed. It's important to get some attention from people who understand films. Yeah, no, I just feel like it creates limitations for independent filmmakers to think it's worth contacting oh. reviewers because they just get depressed by the whole response from the, like, the trolls and stuff. It just makes you go, oh, it doesn't matter because we're never really getting an honest opinion of the film almost. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, sadly, that's it, it, it does hurt them, and I uh, uh, sympathize and empathize with that. I'm not sure what the fix is. Like, I know at a certain point, Rotten Tomatoes will only allow users, like they implement a rule that will only allow users to review a movie after they've proved that they've seen it. That's one way of doing it. That's nice. Um, it's at least some sort of barrier because for some things, like on Amazon, I've read some of those negative reviews for movies that I don't even necessarily like and I can tell that this person didn't watch the movie. Mm -hmm. And that's weird and um, I think the, the, the way to combat that if you are an independent filmmaker is to reach out to people you do know, um, be it critics, other filmmakers, actors, producers, just friends, and try to get word out there. Uh, like like with your stuff, um, through Trash Arts, like the only reason I've ever heard of you is you or somebody on your behalf um, submitted, what's it called? Lonely, Lonely Hearts. Hearts. Yeah. Uh, a lonely hearts for us to review and I happen to be the person at uh, Film Threat to review it I happen to really like it so if you go hey uh, there's 900 reviews on Amazon they're all one star can you like write something up quick because I know I've seen it I'm okay with that uh, but in terms of that sort of thing in terms of getting the word out there now that I know you guys I've seen several movies by you um, and or produced by Trash Arts and uh for the most part, they're good. Not not all of them, uh, but for the most part, they're good. And it helps that you're just trying to get word out there. That way, somebody with uh, a weird sense of humor might watch Toxic Schlock, even though <laughs> I don't totally understand that movie, and they might find something to like about it. But if they can't even find access to it, then I think that's the problem. So I think trying to use the resources available to you, your friends, your families, whomever, uh, and get word out there, that's one way of combating it. Uh, the other way is making sure you are submitting to various 
proper review channels that will be interested in your work. But, you know, there, there is us at Film Threat, but there are other avenues you can explore as well. Um, uh, and, uh, that, and I think if you're tenacious enough, well, it is a lot of work, you believe you'll still be able to find a fan base. Um, because if people don't know you exist, they don't even have the chance to enjoy your work. Does that make sense? That makes complete sense. And like, I always find, yeah. like, I know a lot of filmmakers are fully aware of this, of course, but within the indie community, it's important to have these more, um, I suppose, like respectful sources that you can get good reviews from and will give, ex you know, give a preview or an exclusive or whatever on an upcoming indie film. I think this is important because it does keep everyone in the know. I've noticed a lot with British independent um, community, there's more different websites and different um, horror links things that are trying to spread the words about a collection of filmmakers who are, you start seeing the same names, but in a good way. You start to feel like, oh, actually, these people are getting the correct, the, the, the same sort of promotion. And I think it's really important with the indie community that they realize that they always should reach out to this because most of the time it's free and it's just putting your name forward for a review or in the brilliant sense of what else Film Fret does with uh, Award This. That's amazing that, that you guys have an award ceremony. It just shows a, a bit of recognition for what's, you know, what's been created within that year that's away from the studios. We, uh, for, for people unfamiliar with the work, this uh, film threat uh, has done an award show uh, the past three years now. The, the third one is upcoming. And, um, and we market it as true independent cinema because even if you look at the uh, Independent Spirit Awards, there's a lot of overlap between them and the Oscars. And we, we feel that's not actually representative of... What, of what independent films are doing. Um, so it got created out of a desire to spotlight um, proper, real, independent movies. Like one of the categories is best movie made for under $100,000, hmm. which quite frankly is probably most of the movies that would be nominated anyway. Uh, but the funny part of that is it's... Uh, uh, subtitle, for lack of a better term, is uh, or less than the cost of an Oscar party gift bag. Bloody hell. <laughs> because if you get nominated for an Oscar, the gift bags you get just for like going and being nominated are worth more money than I'll make in two years. It's insane. Um, probably three years? I don't know. A lot. Um, and so we're trying to like, just because this movie costs two thousand dollars doesn't make it bad and you know we we've had success like we're going on our third year it's about to happen in april um so we found success there we we found success by getting people to constantly submit to us through you uh i know uh mj dixon over at my show and that sort of thing has uh, submitted to us since we've taken you know uh uh to giving some of the uh movies good reviews and they know it'll be honest not all the movies are good, and we'll let them know. But sometimes it's a balancing act. Like, okay, e even if they didn't like my last movie, they're still giving me an honest opinion, and I, I can trust it because they're not just saying all my movies are good. Yeah. So you want to take that chance, or do you think there's a better way? Um, and that's up for an individual to decide. No, I think you're right. And I think it's good that, like I said, that Film Threat and other platforms like Horror Screen Bolts and uh, I know there's many more <laughs> Blazing Minds, just thinking of some UK ones. Um, it's good they're there. And it's people need to reach out to them and realise that there is always a surprisingly friendly voice on the other end. In, compared to, you know, when you cold call a random distributor or a random studio and they're like, why are you contacting me? Um, <clears throat> my last question, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Basically, Thank you for me. you're more than welcome, man. Um, yeah, basically, I always ask like a dream project kind of question. Now, seeing as you're not a filmmaker in that respect, as of all the years of learning about filmmaking and discussing film, if you were to make a film, what kind of genre would you want to make a film? If you, the skills were there, the people were there, what would be the one you'd want to tell? I would make an action adventure movie 
as an homage to my favorite genre growing up, you know, like Indiana Jones, the Billy Zane starring The Phantom. I adore that film. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I love action adventure movies, so I would do something in that thing. Nice. Well, who knows? Maybe one day the opportunity will come and the skills will be there and it'll all come together. Who knows? Hopefully one day. Um, but in, in terms of me being a critic, uh, I would... My dream project would be to rewrite the first review I ever did for Film Threat, uh, officially. Uh, not like one of the things I submitted, but the first movie they sent me and said, hey, review this. Um, I still stand by all my opinions in that review, but I, I, I reread it. I'm like, Ooh, that, that, I, I'm not as clear as I should have been. I, I don't think I made my points very well. I, I <laughs> reread it. I'm like, how did they let me keep writing from it? <laughs> I think that's a good thing though, man. Like, it's like all re- review in its sense is a review all. So if you're constantly going back to your own work, like any creative or journalist or any sort of field, you can only improve. So it's a good thing to yes. want to go back to the original almost. There's a few films I've made back 13 years ago and I'm like, maybe one day I'll give that another go. But I'm just never t- totally sure about it, you know? Uh, you've been making movies for that long now, have you? Yeah, Trash Art's been around since uh, 2007. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's been nice. mistake, 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 eventually getting better. That's, that's how I've seen it. <laughs> what was your first movie? Uh, first film was when I was 18. It was called Flummox. Um, I was so bad as a director that the team refused to credit me as a director. They were going to walk off. Uh, there was lots oh. of... <laughs> the early films, when you're 18 and you think you're suddenly a director, there's always the most disastrous experiences possible. You can only learn from them. I'm kind of glad I made those mistakes because I've made so many features since then and it's just from making those mistakes. Very cool. I'll ask about more on that later because I'm very intrigued now. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for joining us today though, Bobby. Um, We'll put like uh, links to Film Threats so people can check it out and of course to award this on April the 18th. Is that correct? Uh, Yeah, so there are two... So there's an in-person one, and then there's the online one. And yes. I'm fairly certain the online portion is the 18th. I don't have it in front of me, though. That's so, okay, though. We'll, we'll put the details on the screen so people can see it. And, yeah, I hope you have a lovely day, and thank you very much for joining us. Yep, thank you for having me. It was awesome to finally get to talk to you, or, uh, not over some form of messenger. <laughs> I'll speak to you soon. All right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. So, thanks for that, Sam. That was a really cool interview. Um, so, yeah, like I said earlier, guys, this week we wanted to look at um, video game films and sort of what makes... Well, what makes a video game film? I suppose it has to be a video game. Um, <laughs> like, but, basically, are they any good? Um, so, really, the first one that I can think of, I think it was actually the first one that was made, is Super Mario Brothers. Starting with the gold. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's just goes mind. all up from here. But the thing that strikes me alarmingly about that film in particular is the fact that they've got this creative like um, content in the form of the game, yeah. and then they don't use anything from the game other than like the names of the characters and stuff and catchphrases. It's, it's just very bizarre. It's weird because like there's, there seems to be quite a lot of video game films where they just go scrap the story, scrap or scrap the whole narrative, but then but then they'll take sort of elements of it and then not not develop upon those or make them any more interesting. They just throw something else that they think is popular. It's like they've never played the game. Yeah. Quite well, often. The thing with Mario as well is that Mario is obviously it's a family game, anyone can play it, but it's aimed at kids. So you make this weirdly sleazy, bizarre New York, everybody's a dinosaur, it's an alternative world. You're like, were you planning to relaunch Mario with this? Usually when you're making a video game movie, you've usually got a video game tied to it. But noticeably, there's no video game version of the the movie of Mario. So you're just like, why did you go in that direction? You wanted to launch a franchise. You wanted to show that, look, we can make lots of money doing this. I think probably... That in their defense, because it's the first time that transition had ever happened from you know a video game into a film, they probably wanted to make it as film 
orientated as possible. That may be true. I, I think there was just a slight, like, probably a level of arrogance about the way that the film was made in terms of what it was looking at as its source material. It, yeah. it was looking at video games as being a low-end, like, kids thing, you know, not, not take it very seriously. Let's just make a film out of it that will sell loads because children will want to see it. And then, yeah. because of that, they didn't, it wasn't, didn't feel like it was well-developed. Well, I mean, like, Let's take away, let's imagine Mario's not involved in that film. It would still be a questionable film for children. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a bizarre film. And like you suddenly have this trend of films that clearly do have budgets because they're associated with you know franchises and businesses that want to spend money to get the best product out there. Yet the next film's like Street Fighter, which is just terrible. Yeah. And it looks like it's like leftover Bond dream kind of locations. It's but again, awful. again, they've they've taken a, a, a source material and then just to, you know thrown it out and and decided to do something entirely different. There was not really much of a street in that film, no. and there wasn't really an awful lot of fighting. Uh, it was mostly like guns and and conversation. Buildings sit around. Yeah, <laughs> well, it was UN. It was like the UN are taking down the bad guy, and you're like, what? Yeah, well, they they, they they were the AN in this film, but they're, uh, they're, yeah. they're, they're they started threatening to shoot people if they if they didn't like submit to arrest immediately. Like I was kind of like, who's the good guys here? I think yeah, I remember you saying that at the time. <laughs> it's kind of interesting though, like to jump past those attempts of alluring in the kids and not and failing terribly. You then go to Mortal Kombat. Now, Mortal yeah. Kombat isn't actually a kids' film. Despite the fact that there's barely any gore, there's a couple of adult moments, I guess. And Mortal Kombat is one of those difficult games that, at that particular time, was heavily attacked by, you know, censors and certain groups and stuff because it's, you know, it's an extremely violent game, not aimed for kids. But of course you're going to play it. I played it like crazy. I love that game. <laughs> so with the film, you kind of felt, all right, they're, they're going to do it right. You can't mess it up. It's just on an island. They're all fighting. They're in the right location. It's not like Street Fighter with no streets. This is on an island. They're all going to fight. And yet, it just becomes boring because you don't focus on the key element of a Mortal Kombat film. The fights. <laughs> you get awful choreography that just doesn't feel fitting and characters that are like shoehorned in because the own franchise has so many characters in the first place. That's another thing with video game movies. They want to shoehorn in as many characters as possible but they give him like a minute moment, which you only know if you're a gamer. You go, oh, that's like in Mortal Kombat. Oh, that reptile is reptile. Oh, look, there's Sub-Zero. Oh, look, there's that character. But if you don't know him, then you've just been introduced to someone who could, might as well just be a CGI blob. Yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a thing about it as well where like you're, you're playing these video games. Like you said, they can be quite violent, but the, the fighting in them feels uh, like you're participating in that fighting. Um, and it's got like this kinetic energy, which they just don't capture in the films because they're too worried about sort of like stunt casting and not mm. not uh, getting people who can actually do the the roles in in the way that they should be done, you know. Um, and, and like you know, there, there just doesn't seem to be the focus on the actual substance of what it is. But it's not like you can't watch a film and feel the kinetic energy in a fight scene, you yeah. know. Like so, so there was ways to do it. But I think again because they saw it as like. They were they were taking something that was a, a silly little kids thing and they were making a movie out of it, you know. So they they kind of ignored that, and was, that, I think that's what people were turning to video games for in that in that point. Like, not that you have to sort of exclusively do one or the other, but you know, video games gave you sort of a break away from that very very synthetic film, uh, the way that things were done at that point, where you had these cheesy one liners yeah, and yeah. these sort of like you it's know, the nineties, isn't it? Yeah. But it's the thing, if you play a computer game and it's full of cheesy one-liners, you can barely understand what the graphics are anyway. It's the 90s. They're, <laughs> they're not like the most beautiful, stunning stories and stuff. It's just a couple of archetypes and stereotypes. Problem is, if you just bring archetypes and stereotypes into a movie, it's nothing. It's There's no context. Movie. Exactly. And a lot of the 90s movies definitely suffer with that. But did you two think then that, like, um, especially with the, them first three that we've mentioned, so Super Mario, um, Street Fighter, and Mortal Kombat, if you think in terms of the gameplay of them games, they're not really massively story-orientated. 
you know, if you think about Super Mario, you get to A to B. Yeah, yeah. You gotta attack mushrooms and stuff and avoid certain things that can kill you. Street Fighter, you know, there's some sort of story with Mortal, Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter in terms of, oh, well, it's good versus bad. But well, that, that's... So when you try to trans, like, uh, to relay that onto film, there's nothing really, there's no real plot device. Mm. Well, Maybe the, that's where it feels. The funny thing is, yeah, like, it's so obvious, but if you remember in the original games, you could, you'd have like a page and it would tell you the whole life story of that character and <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. why you chose your character. That's what it feels like in those films. That you're getting that page down to one little aspect and going, all right, they're a sumo wrestler. Like in Street Fighter, there's a sumo wrestler character who's supposed to be being part of the street fight to prove that sumo is a justified fighting style. <laughs> and in the film, none of that is relevant. He's a news reporter who suddenly goes, oh, now I'm a sumo wrestler. And you're like, oh, okay, that's that guy. And it's, it's that laziness where they just want to get to... It becomes almost Stuff like happening. cosplay. It just feels yeah. like cosplay. See, I, I remembered that character in the film. I've never, I've not, I wasn't really into like the fighting games, or the combat kind of games. But <clears throat> uh, yeah, I just remembered, and from that description, it, <laughs> that character is ridiculous. <laughs> it's it's interesting though because in the type of video games that started coming out, I remember like um, whenever you had the PS One, um, so way before Xbox for any Xbox fans out there, but like you had the PS One. And um, I think the graphics and stuff and storytelling started to become a bit more coherent, I suppose, yeah. or more relevant in video games. So one of the major ones that made the transition into a film is Lara Croft. So if you think about Lara Croft, there's, you know, straight, like, plot the whole way throughout. And then they transitioned that into a film. And I, I don't think Lara Croft's a bad film at all. I think it actually probably... It came a, out at the right time. Yeah, it's a nothing -y film. You know, it's not bad. It's got a good actress in the lead role of Angelina Jolie because she was an icon at that point. And the weird thing with Lara Croft is, like, she did... You think about, like, Sony's promotion of PlayStation. They did a lot of cosplaying with Lara Croft before people were full-on cosplaying. Mm. People were always dressed up as her. So there was already this kind of she-can-be-a-real-person action star. And, of course, Angelina Jolie really looked like her. So it all just kind of fit into place. And that does feel like a particular role, which was like, you know, she looks like her, she's going to be perfect for the role. And you see that sometimes with the casting in those films. And it, you're right, it's not a bad film. And weirdly, you don't suddenly see all these other action films coming out. If anything, the focus was more on, like, doing horror. Yeah. You see all these <clears throat> horror games turn into films, like Resident yeah. Evil, Silent Hill. House and one of the yeah, House of <laughs> the Dead. Doom. Well, Doom was actually a little bit later. These were the first Doom ones. Doom was, what, 2005? Yeah. House of the Dead was 2003. Resident Evil was 2002. Now, um, Resident Evil's Mortal Kombat guy again, which, again, it's a passable film. There's nothing terrible about it. It has nothing to do with the game. But, you know, whatever. House of the Dead, on the other hand, begins a particular career of a filmmaker <laughs> who is downright awful. Do you want to pronounce his Uvi name? Ball. Yeah. <laughs> he's a, he's a, a German filmmaker um, and is absolutely awful at filmmaking. We we, we were laughing at the um, House of the Dead oh, uh, and uh, I, I felt guilty for a bit because, you know, we, we're all filmmakers here and, and like it's uh, sometimes you feel bad for laughing at someone else's work because, you know, they might be trying their best. Uh, but I looked him up and uh, he said some pretty horrific things, including anti-Semitism and homophobia. So I thought, like, oh, well, I'm not... <laughs> very I feel angry. all right about laughing at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> the thing with House of the Dead is if the House of the Dead game is like an old shoot -em up that you do at the arcades. And the story is really simple. There's a mad scientist who's trying to resurrect some zombies and two agents are going to run in and try and save his wife because she's been kidnapped. Simple story, right? Yeah. What does the movie do? Because it's two thousands and everyone's having raves. Apparently, it's about a bunch of people going to an island to rave. But there's an old Spanish guy from the sixteen hundreds who did zombie experiments, and the two just collide. And it's so cheap. It's so horribly cheap. And you just like I genuinely think that film hurt the brand of House of the Dead because it's just awful. Yeah. And the one thing that you want to see is is decent. Um, 
fight scenes, decent like shooting scene. Like you know, you want you want some the uh, shooting scene. You just the shooting me scenes were just awful. And, and, like you had no idea. Like there was a whole battleground moment, and you had no <laughs> idea where yeah, anyone huh? was <laughs> or what was happening or who was shooting what. Like it was just like cameras spinning around them in slow motion, shooting into a random space that you don't know. Like they're not hitting anything, so this <laughs> it just it just felt awful. It, yeah. It's There's just, nothing good about it. I think it. As well, like in that particular scene that you're talking about, or the scene that went on for like 24 years, and um, yeah, there's infinity ammo, but it's also like they didn't have the cast, like um, like the amount of extras. Yeah, yeah. So they're trying to f like almost shoot really close, but it doesn't work for it. And they're trying to make it seem like there's a load of zombies, yeah. whereas actual fact, when they do pawn out a little bit, it's like oh, there's four guys. <laughs> the thing is with, with zombie films as we all know like you, you can make smaller independent zombie films it just takes a bit of creativity he doesn't have any no. and like you, you see it reoccurring and he's made so many films based on computer games and he doesn't seem to care they're all terrible and they keep making them and they're real like low brand ones you know and like we said the bar isn't very high either way for making a fucking video game movie but for some reason he goes right let's go lower let's go right down there to the bottom and choosing obscure titles and for those fans those films those games are ruined you know yeah yeah i i, I really think he's a he, he's just going through trashing video games and he himself <laughs> yeah, that's his sole purpose his, his he, he's he said uh, one of his quotes is i've never played any video games i don't play the video games that i make into films and you just think, well, how how are you qualified to do that? You should be a fan. Is it of just the game. like a, a cheaper way to get into the industry? Well, there's the rumor, and again, rumor, just because you know I can't be saying rumors and stuff. <laughs> but tax breaks to do with Germany, and that's why he's made so many films that haven't made any money. A bit like the uh, Max Bielstock in uh, the Producers. <laughs> so, but there's no confirmation on that. That's just a rumor. <laughs> Before we get sued, yeah, no, one, no one listens. But if they did, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> to all our fans out there, we love you. <laughs> Going back with the horror games, so like, it's interesting because obviously horror is supposed to scare you, yeah. And I really think it's a it's a horrifyingly sadistic thing that computer games have horror computer games because it really can grab you, like, and you're like, oh, this is silly. I'm playing a game. I shouldn't be scared. When a film effectively never does it right. Like Resident Evil, they made it more of an action game. Silent Hill had all the atmosphere and great actors and you're just like, all right, this is cool, it's going well. And then it just throw you something CGI that's right in front of you that's surely iconic in the game, but just takes you out of it and suddenly you remember that you're in all the mechanisms of the game. See, this is one of the fundamental things, I think, where film adaptations of video games fall down. So I wrote my dissertation um, many, many moons ago on <laughs> performance within gaming. Yeah. So <clears throat> if you think of um, any type of live performance or when you read, you effectively have that fourth wall in front mm -hmm. of you. So you're always watching it through your own eyes, experiencing the, the stuff that someone else is going through. Even in theatre, like they're right in front of you, but you still have that fourth wall. Yeah. Um, whenever it comes to video games, you effectively embody that character so with Silent Hill, for example, that's why it's scary. I think there's a game called Fear, which is one of the scariest video games like ever. And it's because you're completely immersed within the game. You're invested in the yeah. character that you're playing. So as, to right? try and then transition that over to film where you're not as immersed, I think that's where it falls down. Yes, there's different factors to that where it's the CGI can be fucking terrible. And you're just like, oh, yeah, yeah. well, that's just bad. I think it's. I think it's also difficult. Like it's got to be almost impossible, actually, to to transition a, a video game where you have that like immersive experience, where you're actually playing out those things, and then turn it into this passive experience where you're watching these things play out. Now, I, maybe maybe I'm going a bit because you know I could see a film being made out of like. A, a game with the with the sort of action as a like a backdrop to a story going on, yeah. but I just I, it always seems to fail. There was a, a thing came out, um, what was it, a couple of years ago on Netflix, and it was like an immersive film. Oh yeah, I, I can't remember what it was. I so, believe it was um, Black Mirror. It was wasn't Black it? Mirror. Yeah. I thought it was. Um, so yeah, like I think that if they were to make a an adaptation of a video game in that style. 
you could kind of then become immersed. I don't know, I still think it's a, like a, a more limited version on how immersed you can be compared to a, It'd be limited. To a video game. Don't get me wrong, but you're you're choosing the next steps and the you know the next mm. actions of that. Because like what really immerses you in film is the characters that you identify with. And in games you don't need that so much. No. You do need characters to identify with, but like because you're playing as that character, you immediately identify with them because you like choose what colour they wear or you know yeah, other yeah. such little things that you can manipulate about that um, yeah like uh, film has to do different work in order to immerse you and that's where I think the, the two sometimes don't yeah I would mesh. agree with that on a, a certain scale but I think as well from being a, like big into my games as I am I need something that's going to grip me like if a story is basically very very linear and doesn't really captivate me then I'm not immersed I don't really enjoy it I'll put the game down like whereas there's stories that will capture me and then I don't want it to end because it's like oh god this is so like intense and really mm. good that's what I don't think they transition over mm. as well into film I, I think mean, you can have a film that's awesome don't get me wrong you can watch a film that you completely captivate it in but there's never been a good rendition from a video game mm. The um to to go back to your immersive um, point, there's only one game film or film that I feel like actually gets close to what the game experience, and it's in only in the last like ten minutes, and that's Doom, because Doom is a first person shooter, first person, doesn't yeah, it? and it really makes you feel like you're in it. The energy suddenly come up, things are popping out like you're in a computer game, and you're like, why didn't they do that for the whole entire film? Because I think you'd end up mm -hmm. feeling like you were watching someone else play a video game. Then I don't you? know because like, like the thing is, the less really. you know, you might as if you're watching it all the way through, you might as well be playing it. Well, well no, because if you if you took it from an idea of there is no character, mm -hmm. and then you put in, and you know like because Doom there isn't really a character; it's just some dude, and he goes into hell and has to fight all the aliens and shit. If they went for the most basic Doom storyline, but gave you all that first-person perspective where it's cinematically completely gripping, you'd be immersed. I feel like the Doom movie has a whole different entire storyline to the game anyway. It's just the last 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, the closest a film has tried to do the same thing, and, with, and again, I didn't like it because it was too much like a computer game, was Hardcore Henry. Because yeah. that is the closest you've got to being within a computer game as a movie experience. Mm. But the story is terrible. So it still doesn't work for me. Yeah. You still need those elements that you expect from a good film. You can have all that, like, it's like the new Mortal Kombat film that's coming out. Mm. The trailer looks amazing. It looks like a huge improvement. Again, the previous films weren't a lot to try and climb up to. But for me, it's all about those fight scenes. And they've got real fighters in for this one. And because of films like The Raid and... Um, saw that resurgence in the old school sort of fighting, I have confidence in it. But then there might be the missing element of there's still no decent story. I don't know, like it's, I feel like it can work one day. I always thought it could when I was a kid. I loved PlayStation 2 and I always thought that every movie that could be a computer game was gonna be great because I liked the computer game, you know, naive childhoods. And it's never been true. And although I don't really play computer games anymore or particularly care about it, I want to see some more successful ones because it's all storytelling at the end of the day. Can you imagine right? a Red Dead film? <laughs> that's, that's the one thing I've, I've always thought those games shouldn't be turned to films, like yeah. GTA. Look, it's kind of like they're a film in themselves <laughs> it's, yes, when you yeah. play it because there's lo loads of cinematics and stuff like that. Well, the storylines, like GTA is a great example of a game that has cinematic storylines where you feel you're immersed in the character and you're, you know, there's like changes and twists and you, you're doing everything within it. As a film, that's just any crime film with yeah. a good story. So it's like yeah, and often with those crime films, you can't um, uh, like and and deliberately so you can't identify directly with the main character who's a criminal. Like you couldn't watch a, a character running around down the street just shooting people at random and be like, yeah, that's my guy. Yeah. I'm on his side, <laughs> you know. But when you're playing GTA, well, that's that's how you feel. So I mean, there's there's definitely some films out there that take inspiration from video games definitely crank <laughs> crank yeah I'm, I'm thinking of like fast and furious to a degree um, need for speed yeah, speed yeah need for speed is the film but that, that probably wasn't as good and um, and it came too little too late like need for speed i think the first one came out around about 2002 i want to say oh yeah and the film didn't come out so like 2016 i think more fast and furious films became a bit more like yeah. those games yeah that's what i'm saying yeah, so like yeah. the the influence was there but I think whenever you take um, a game and then label it the same name as a film, 
automatically it kind of gets this bad stigma that oh well video game transitions into film aren't really that good mm -hmm. whereas if you don't and you just say it's kind of a source material but it's labeled as something else for the film they tend to do a lot better like crank was it's not an amazing film but it's a hell fun of a lot watch. of fun yeah, yeah. Well, when you even even when you think of like Scott Pilgrim versus the World, for example, yeah. like that that the whole thing plays out like a video game um, where you've got boss fights after boss fight, um, and uh, you know very very obviously embraces that whole dynamic. Um, you know, even showing sort of scoring points yeah, and certain yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, but that's the thing is that that when you're taking sort of influences from video games and imagery from video games, it's very different to trying to translate an actual storyline from video game. It seems and, and like because most of those seem to be quite su like successfully done. Those those things that have been inspired by the uh, aesthetic of video games. Well, I suppose think of it this way: inspiration is usually fan led. So Edgar Wright probably plays video games, mm. and that's why it works so well in Scott Pilgrim. Yeah. Plus, it's based on a comic book, which used those elements as well. Yeah. Whereas you make a film about Mortal Kombat back in the nineties, why are you making it? Are you making it for creative reasons? Because it's only been around for a couple of years. Well, it's a successful game, isn't it? Yeah, you're making it for money reasons, so you don't care about all those extra little touches. It's also um, going back to when vid game, sorry, going back to when films can feel like video games. There's a, you, you notice it a lot in um, adventure films for a bit of time where you sort of felt like you were just sitting back going, oh, it's a video game now. We're not watching the film anymore. Like The Hobbit suffered mm. a lot of the chase sequences and stuff. And um, Alice in Wonderland has the same problems. And I get it. They're trying to basically say, you know, this is what young kids are so used to games that we need to build our films to feel like it. It's and it fetch just question. takes you away. It's like, that's what The Rise of Skywalker got a lot of criticism for, is it felt like a video game. It's like, go to this point, collect that. Yeah. Oh, go to this point, collect that. Oh, go to that point. Oh, we've got everything we need. Now we can fight the... You notice it a lot more, and it does get a bit like, okay, and I get it, because they want the, that audience who are used to that kind of media they're consuming. They're not going straight to watching Netflix. Mm. They're playing a video game. That's the storylines they know. But, but I, I just think that when you're using different mediums, different formats of, of narrative telling, you've got to approach it differently. And I think that's the, that's the problem that transitioning video games into films has always done, is they're not quite sure how to look at it differently. And I'm not sure there's even an answer. I, I don't know what you would well, do to make a good uh, film out of a video game. So personally, I'm a massive Assassin's Creed fan. You guys know that. <laughs> yeah. I have the logo tattooed on my back. That kind of gives you an idea of how much of a fanboy I am. Um, Occasionally and I, hides in the shadows and just pretends to stab me in the neck. With my hood up, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or sneak into the kitchen. Um, but yeah, basically, uh, with the way that that story element was created for the game, it's that is a great foundation to be able to trans like or to basically cross over into a film. You can take that idea and place it anywhere in history and just put a good storyline within it or just take a point in history and fictionalise it a little bit as the games do. Um, but that was a massive failure. And the, the reason, personally, I think it was a massive failure is because it spent too long away from what makes everything great about Assassin's Creed. Yeah. So they focus more on the, the modern day and... You know, whether you love or hate the modern day, that's what kind of divides fans a lot within the more recent games. It's just like there's not enough if there's either not enough or it's too convoluted or it's like uh, it's a back like um you know, it's taking a back seat. What makes Assassin's Creed good is the time period and you know what's going on within that and the assassin element and um but it just didn't land. And I think if they had it done more of the time period and focused on that, that would have actually made the film really decent. I think they should treat um, video game movies kind of like the Lego movie. They're fun movies. They're supposed, to, they're, they're supposed to take elements, but you can create your own story within it. So, like, <clears throat> not for every game, of course, but one game that I always wanted to make into a film was Worms. And I always thought, if I did a Worms game... Yeah, you can hear it again. <laughs> if, I did a, <laughs> if I did a Worms game, I'd want to do a, like, you know, like a serious story, like Apocalypse Now. Don't give away too but much. But with the Worms characters... <laughs> And like with using those ridiculous and absurd ideas like a banana bomb, but showing the serious effects it has on the worms. Because <laughs> that makes it humorous to me and it makes me remind me that I had fun playing that game. Because you get into a warlike mentality with those sort of games. 
with those story led games. Yeah, when 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 you see that that banana bomb coming and yeah. it, it hits you, it's it's very very depressing seeing your whole team die. <laughs> well, this is it. Those kind of films, <clears throat> they're not going to make money. And now at the moment, video game movies aren't. They they make some money, but they're never as big because they try to go with the big massive budget. Because the Resident Evil ones, they're not that expensive. The, when they went for Prince of Persia and those kind of films that were like 100 mil budget and were going to be these massive career launches and blah, 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 blah. It was going to turn JJ on to a massive action star and all that. And they failed. So mm -hmm. they stepped back again. The next wave seems to be that TV is going to be a place for video games. See, I think th there's talk of The Last of Us going into production um, as a TV series. I think that's actually quite a good one to have a launch pad from. Great story. If you can translate that into like a TV show but it also gives you if you think of like a game any decent game has to be at least 40 hours long yeah like playable content so there's a lot to unpack within that that's 40 hours that you're trying to put into an hour and a half two hour film you can't get everything in so if you break that down in bite-sized chunks of like a 50 minute show that has 10 episodes actually I suppose you could probably relay a lot more information yeah i mean i'm interested to see what this modern period of of turning uh, or the current period of turning video games into into films is, is going to bring because obviously we've got borderlands yeah um, well, coming love. um and there borderlands are a few, could be a real fun one yeah yeah there's and there's, there's a few that. there's a few others that that where the video games now are so much more advanced in terms of the narrative and stuff like that that you're, you're spending like you said like 40 hours um playing it um, whereas back in the day, you think of like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter and Mario. There's not really no. that much narrative content to even. So if, if they're probably going to have the opposite problem now and have too much to condense, rather than. Uh, but then that works quite well for for books being converted into films. So um, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, it's the thing. Like like I said before, with the nineties, the games hadn't been around that long. It was all completely capitalist driven. We can totally understand that. But now we're in this kind of new wave of these games having legacy and time. Fans are wanting to make the stories. So maybe there'll be a bit more delicacy to it. Maybe there won't be. There still is no evidence to support there ever will be. <laughs> but maybe there will be. So thank you guys for listening. If there's any video game films that you can think of, please let us know in the comments. And uh, as ever, leave a like. Please subscribe and hit the notification bell to get news of whenever we release a new video. Um, so other than that, guys, Trash Arts Takeout. Bye. Ta-da.